Well, good morning, everyone. This is Pastor Milton talking to you from the Calcium Community Church once again. Just, uh, I've got to admit that as I look around the church right now, it looks better than I did last Sunday in one sense. It's been completely repainted in the sanctuary here, and the chairs have all been taken out, um, cleaned very thoroughly, steam cleaned, and put back in. However, I'm still obviously not looking at any congregation in the chairs. Got to wait on the Governor Cuomo's uh, timing for that, I guess. We're still under that no more than 10 people allowed to congregate at once. But what we're going to be doing this morning is talking about an incident that took place on the day of the resurrection. It took place shortly after Jesus arose from the grave. Actually, I should be very careful about how I say that. It took place on the afternoon of that day. There were several things that take place in the morning, so I'll see. And that's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the afternoon, and this is, as you may have noticed on the title screen, talking about the Emmaus Road. Now, this is one of those incidents that I find fascinating because of what happens. There's several things involved. Some of them are seem to go along with his normal miracles and such, but there's a couple of really special things. Let me start by reading you some of the verses, and hopefully I'll be able to get through a discussion of all of them, but you know me. Sometimes when I get talking, I realize my time's going by awful fast. In verse 13 of Luke chapter 24 says, And behold, two of them, and these are two of the followers of Jesus, not the actual 12 disciples, but two of the followers. Two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden so that they should not know him. That's a pretty special miracle right there. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, saying unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he, Jesus, said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, Today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher, and then when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then said he, Jesus, unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I love that. I love that idea that he spent that time telling them how all of the prophecies of the Old Testament about the Messiah applied to him. I would have loved to have been there and listened in on that one. That would have been a, what an incredible lecture. But that we get to that later. <laughs> There's a lot to cover before we get there. And I want to take a moment before we go any further, before I even start any more talking, to take a moment to pray. 
My dear God, as we come together, I am so glad for another chance to gather around your word and to speak, even though it's remotely, to those who love your word and want to hear about you and want to hear what you have for them. Lord God, I know that this remote situation doesn't change the fact that your Holy Spirit is guiding your words and the effect of them on people. God, you promise that your word never returns void. What a wonderful promise from Isaiah that whenever your word is spoken, that it will accomplish something, whatever it is that you want it to accomplish. And Lord, I depend on that because I know that my words aren't worth much of anything, but your words are always great. I ask you, God, just to deal with this message as it goes out to whoever, to every single person who hears it. And I pray that you will be watching over them and that you will bless them in some way today, whatever it is they need. If they need some kind of physical help, if they need spiritual guidance, if they need strengthening emotionally, or I don't know, anyway, you know all about it. You know the different things that are going on. And so I pray, God, for those folks, every single one of them, and for myself as well, Lord God, for your blessing on each of us. Thank you, God, in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Um, to get started, I have to look at the situation. As I told you, this is the afternoon of the day that Christ rose from the grave. This is the resurrection day still. And he's got a lot to, he's done a lot of things already. He's got a lot more that he's going to do. This first day, the day that he rose from the grave, we have a whole lot of things listed that Jesus did. People that he talked to, people that he visited, things that he said, things that are great to study. But for this one, I want to look at this particular situation. Now, the two people that it tells us about that went from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now, we can see later on in the chapter that they went to apparently back to their home. They must have been from Emmaus. Now, it tells us that Emmaus was a certain distance from Jerusalem. Well, if you convert it to our terms, it was about seven miles. So they were walking from Jerusalem to their home in Emmaus, a seven mile walk. Now for them, that probably wasn't much of anything. They walked a lot back then. For me, that would be a pretty substantial walk. <laughs> I don't walk that much anymore. But how long would it take? Well, probably two and a half, three hours for them maybe. Would have been more for me. So when they are walking along, we don't see anything that explains why they were leaving Jerusalem and going back home. I've heard a lot of preachers make a big deal out of this, saying that they had given up on Christ, given up on his teachings, and were going home to start over again. It doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't tell us why they were headed out. It just says that they were leaving Jerusalem and going back to their home. Now we know that the followers of Christ, including his own disciples, at this point were basically hiding, trying to keep out of sight of the Jewish authorities. All the priests and their uh, followers, because they were afraid they might want to have them executed too, just like they did Jesus. And they probably would have if they had a chance. So maybe these two were just afraid and wanted to get out of town where they thought they'd be safer. Don't really know. I just know that for whatever reason, it tells us they were on their way back to their home in Emmaus. But you notice what they were talking about, and it, it makes sense when you think about what they'd been through. They'd been following Jesus. They'd been traveling with him. And now they had seen the crucifixion. Now they had heard, as we find out in the verses we read, about the resurrection. They had heard a rumor. They, that's how they looked at it at this point. They didn't have any verification and they weren't really sure whether or not they believed it. So they were talking about all these things. They talked together of all these things which had happened. And then the one thing that I love here is that Jesus himself shows up. But I like the fact that there's a little special miracle here 
that as Jesus appears to them, they don't know who it is. For whatever God did, their eyes were held so that they couldn't recognize Jesus as himself, as the Savior, as the teacher that they had followed all of those times. So he joins with them. And I like the way that it mentions it here. Verse 15 says, And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. You notice how it ex refers to the way they were talking to each other? While they communed together and reasoned. That word reasoned is one that has to do with logic. They were thinking it through, analyzing, thinking about everything that had happened and trying to figure out just what all this means. So it was something that was definitely a big part of their thinking right now. What was the results for the followers of Christ of the fact that he had been crucified and now maybe, they weren't sure, maybe rose again. I like the idea that he chose these two to appear to among several others during that first day we don't know who these two are. They're not mentioned anywhere else. And we only know the name of one of them, Cleopas. Most people kind of assume that this was Cleopas and his wife. Maybe, doesn't say so. It was Cleopas and one other person. But since it says that they were going to their home, I would guess that it, uh, it's a pretty good guess that this was his wife that was with him. And what Jesus does when he appears as a, just one more traveler along the road and stops and talks to them, or walks along with them and talks to them, he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? He says, What are you guys talking about? <laughs> I love the way Jesus did that so often when he was dealing with anybody. He would ask them a question when you know he knew the answer. Even if he hadn't been God, I think he would have known the answer on this one. But he asks them a question so that they will start talking to him and express themselves and kind of explain what they're thinking. It makes a, a situation like sometimes when you and I might go to God in prayer about a situation. And as we are praying, we're thinking it through, talking it through with God. And he brings to mind some of the things we hadn't yet thought of. Well, that's basically what Jesus is going to do with these guys. He's going to get them talking and explaining what they think and feel. And then he's going to tell them what they're missing. Look it down to verse 18 when he asked them, what are you talking about? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Basically, he says, where are you from that you don't know all about it? Where are you from that you don't know what's been going on? Everybody knows. Well, once again, yeah, Jesus did know what they were talking about and exactly what they thought about it. But he got them talking. And he, Jesus, said unto them, What things? Don't you love it? Don't you know all this stuff? What don't I know? Making them, again, express themselves. And they said unto him, Notice it says, They said unto him, not just Cleopas this time, but he and his companion got in on the conversation now. They said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. I'd like to stop right there because I want to point out what they said. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, and how do they describe him? A prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. In other words, a great teacher, and much more than that, he did great things. 
and he says, a great teacher and a great preacher before God and man. He says, the people cared too. They recognized him as being something very special, at least a prophet, even if they didn't go farther than that. But then he goes on in verse 20, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. He explains the part that must have been the most shocking and most disturbing to them, the fact that Christ had allowed himself to be crucified. And then he goes on to why this is so much of a problem in their thinking and in their hearts. Look at the next verse, verse 21. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. We thought he was the Messiah, the Redeemer. And then he says, and I love this, and besides all this, he says, as if this wasn't enough, now we also have this to figure out. Today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. Now remember how many times Jesus had told his disciples and his followers that he was going to be arrested, crucified, buried, and would rise again on the third day? Over and over again he told them this. Did it sink in? <laughs> Apparently not to most of them. There's only one person ever spoken of in the Gospels that clearly understood what Jesus was saying about that, and that is Mary of Bethany. Because remember when she anointed Jesus' feet with oil, with that precious ointment, Jesus said that she it is doing this for my burial ahead of time. She understood. She believed. When the disciples and so many other followers just didn't seem to get it. But here they're saying, some women of our bunch, of our group, went to the sepulcher early and claimed that his body was gone and that angels said he had risen. Do you get the idea that they're a little skeptical? Yeah, it sure sounds like it. Very skeptical of these women and their report. I guess I've got to point out one thing before I go on, and that is, back then, I wouldn't say that women were considered second-class citizens, but in some ways, yeah, they were. Because, for instance, in, gen in normal circumstances back then, a woman was not allowed to own property of her own. Also, a woman was not allowed to testify in court, for her word was not taken as being valid in court. So yeah, there was some uh, bias against women back then. One, one of the things that changed as Christianity went around the world because we find that the Bible says so very clearly that it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, whether your skin color is black, white, yellow, or anything else, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, God cares about you as an individual. God sees you as equal in his eyes to any other person. That's something that people sometimes seem to get really confused about in the Bible or concerning the Bible. They seem to have the idea that the Bible is, oh man, I've heard people say the Bible is anti-woman or anti-this or anti-that. They're just not reading it. They are picking out little passages and misreading them or misapplying them. They're not reading the whole of Scripture to see what it says. And, of course, you see all kinds of people that do that for, to push whatever their particular agenda is. Satan himself loves to twist the Scripture and use it to try and mess us up. That's always been true, always going to be true, I guess. But we need to be careful about that, which is why you need to be in the Word of God every day. And you need to be knowing the Word of God 
well so that you can see when somebody is saying something that just doesn't match up to scripture. <sighs> Had an instance of that just a couple of days ago where somebody was talking to me about where they had been told about Noah in the ark and what he had been told wasn't matching the scripture at all. So I had to take him back to the scriptures to see what the Bible actually says. Um, where he had gotten the information, I don't know, but it certainly wasn't from the Bible. I love the fact, do you know how the uh, FBI and the Treasury Department teach people to recognize counterfeit money. They don't do it by having them study counterfeit money. They do it by having them handle the real thing over and over and over until they recognize the counterfeit because it either doesn't feel right, it doesn't look right, they know what the real thing is, what it should be. And that's the way we need to be with God's Word. We need to be thoroughly knowledgeable about what God has put in his Bible so that when somebody tells us something that just doesn't jibe, it sounds wrong to us and we can pick it out. Um, that was a little off the subject, but I think it's an important point. Here, these people tell Jesus this, that these women said they saw angels, which said that Jesus had rose. And then they follow it up with, and certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. They were adding a little more evidence for the idea that Jesus had risen from the grave. You see, when Mary Magdalene and the other women went back and told the disciples what they had found and what they had seen, you may remember that two of the disciples... Peter and John immediately left and ran to the gravesite, ran to the tomb to see if what the women said was true. And as these followers here on the Emmaus Road tells them, they saw an empty tomb. The stone rolled away, the tomb was empty, the grave clothes were lying there empty. And he says, uh, but they didn't see Jesus. No, they didn't, because he wasn't there. He was out and around, about doing several other things. But I love what Jesus does next. Then he said unto them, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Does that sound like a rebuke? Yeah, it is, definitely. He was rebuking them because, well, number one, he calls them fools. Ouch. I would not want to hear God call me a fool. <laughs> I'm sure that he has certainly has had reason to a whole lot of times, but nevertheless, I would not want him to say that to me. He says to them, fools, but look at what he says it. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He says, don't you believe what the prophets said? What they said was going to happen to the Messiah? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? He says, isn't this what the Bible said was supposed to happen to the Messiah? Isn't he supposed to go through all this? Isn't he supposed to die, be buried, and rise again? He says, if the prophets said it, why don't you believe it? And then, look at verse 27. To me, this is the most wonderful verse in this section in several ways. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What it's saying is that he started right back in the book of Genesis, the books of Moses, went right through the whole Old Testament telling them where each of the prophecies referred to him as the Messiah and how he had fulfilled every one of those prophecies. I love that. 
I, as I said, I would love to have been able to walk along behind them and just listen. Man, what a lecture, what a, a learning experience that must have been. To hear him describe the prophecies and how each of those prophecies have to do with the work of the Messiah and how he fulfilled them all. I would, man, I would love to have been along with them. We have on the wall of our church, on the side wall over there that I'm looking at right now, a painting, um, a copy of a painting, which is called the Emmaus Road. And it shows these three people walking along and talking as Jesus explains to them the prophecies. And I've always loved that picture. I've seen it in books, I've seen it all over the place, but I'm glad we have it on our church wall because it is such an incredible reminder. Who better to explain to anyone the prophecies that God has given about the Messiah? Jesus Christ himself explained to them. Man, what an experience that would have been. Now, I don't think I have time to go through any more than where I've just gone other than to mention when they get to Emmaus, Jesus acts like he's going to keep on going, that he's got somewhere else to go. They ask him, stop, come to our house for supper. And so he does. And it says that as he broke the bread and gave it to them, their eyes were opened and God let them recognize that this was Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. And you know what they did? It says in that moment when they recognized that Jesus disappeared from their sight. But I like what they did because you remember here they just left Jerusalem, walked all the way to Emmaus, trying to figure out what they were going to do next, thinking that their experience with the Christ was over. Instead, as soon as they realized that we just saw the real Jesus Christ, Messiah, resurrected Messiah, they turn around and go all the way back to Jerusalem, seven miles back again, and rush to the disciples and tell them, guess what happened to us? I wish I could have been just to see that too. That would have been great. They came to the disciples and told them, we have seen Christ. He is alive. That would have been great. And so they... God opened their eyes and allowed them, after all of the explanations, after all of the teaching, after all the doctrine, God opened their eyes and let them see that this was Christ that was telling them this. Man, what a way to make it plain that they better be paying attention, that they should think back very carefully on what he said. What about us? When we read in the Bible, we're reading God's word. We're reading the words that God put there for us to know about him and about ourselves, to know about the plan of salvation, to know about how he wants us to live, to know about his promises for now and for eternity. And do we pay attention the way we would if we realized we were walking alongside the resurrected Savior? I'm not sure how carefully they remembered everything that he had said, but I'll bet they did an awful lot of thinking about it. I hope that we pay that much attention to God's word as we have it in front of us day after day. As we realize this is the word of God, not just another book, and that this has to do with eternity. I love the verse that tells us that forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. In other words, God's word is true now. It was true when he wrote it through now, always will be. It's not going to change. And you know why that is? Because God doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's something to keep in mind. Oh, I know, all kinds of people love to rewrite the scriptures or to put them in some uh, another form, you know, um, modern English, something else they oftentimes most of these modern English versions I have to say I don't care for because so many of them leave out portions of scripture that the King James includes and that the early versions all included 
To me, that's wrong. They're playing around with God's word. Now, that's based on somebody's opinion that these may not have been originally there. Well, I got news for you. I believe that the Bible is God's word and that he's not letting anybody add to it or take away from it without him noticing and being ready to do something about it. Someday, every one of us, each of us, you and me, and every one of those folks will stand before God, will stand before Jesus Christ, our Savior, to be judged for the things that we have done in our body. Now, for the believer, we have a promise that our sins are forgiven if we have asked Christ to be our Savior. For the unbeliever, that's just not there. And they have a real dangerous, a real, <laughs> how can I say it, horrific surprise ahead of them. So if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I sure hope you'll talk to somebody today and see what I'm talking about. Find out why it matters. Let's stop there and let's take a few moments to pray. God, you are the Almighty God, the Savior the king, the master of all things, the one who, who created the world, who runs the world right now, and who will someday judge each of us. God, I'm thankful for who you are and what you are. I'm thankful for so many blessings. Man, oh man, as I look around today, it's a beautiful day. And I'm thinking about the blessings that you have given me and so many others. I ask you, Lord God, to be with those people who are listening to this whenever it happens to be and wherever they happen to be. You know them, God. You know each one of those folks. You know their hearts. You know their souls. You know their lives. You know what's going on in them. I pray for them, God. I pray for your blessings upon them, your mercy and your peace and your grace. And I just look forward to what you're going to be doing in the days to come. In Christ's name, amen.